my life actually looks probably exactly like what I would have hoped for for myself as a younger man, you know, have a wonderful woman, you know, my wife, Kristen, in my life, and, and my son, you know, get to climb, be close to the climbing, work for myself. I guess I, I, guess I figured it out finally <laughs> after a few detours. You know, if you live in town, you can literally walk out your back door and, and climb. And uh, yeah, it's obviously good for the body other than, you know, <laughs> destroying my finger tendons and, and shoulders and all that, the wear and tear, I think, of being an aging climber. But uh, it keeps you in good shape. It gives you a reason to stay in shape because in order to, to climb your best, you know, you want to be fit. And, and I had a very sort of dark, obsessive relationship with climbing, I think, through my teens and, and 20s into my early 30s. Uh, I think like any sport, if if you push yourself at it, there's a huge potential for becoming obsessive and making bad choices with your health. Um, for me in climbing, there's not pressure in climbing, but if you want to climb hard, you know, you need to focus on the strength to weight ratio. You know, the less mass, pure mass you have to pull up, the easier it is. You know, the less load must be borne by your fingers and forearms. So climbers have always been somewhat obsessed with being thin, and, and I certainly took that way too far. Um, when I was probably from about 16 till age 21, I really just didn't eat very much. I thought that the easiest way to improve my strength to weight ratio was to be as thin as possible instead of thinking, oh, I should just eat healthy and train a little harder. So I actually uh, had a pretty unhealthy relationship with the sport at that point. In the, in the name of climbing harder and harder, more difficult climbs, I was um, certainly compromising my physical health. Auschwitz boy, yeah, that's what my friends were calling me for a while because I was so thin, you could see all my ribs, you know, through my, through my skin. And I, I was kind of proud of that. I was like, yeah, that means I'm really doing very well at, at starving myself. I started to have panic attacks, I think, as a result of, you know, six years of really limiting food. I wasn't eating fat at all, which is terrible for your brain. Um, barely eating protein. You know, I think I just got it in my head that I was fat and I needed to be thin and thinner and thinner and thinner. But as, as it started to get really bad, I was just eating like something like a can of green beans a night. And, all this diet hot, hot cocoa to kind of tamp down my appetite. I was told if you have multiple panic attacks, you have a panic disorder. I was also told I had, uh, you know, major depressive disorder at that point. You know, it was sort of never presented as these panic attacks are transitory. Perhaps there's a reason for it that we can we can get at and unearth and and, and uproot you know, in order that this is just a temporary phase. You know, it was just sort of, oh, you have you have a panic disorder, this is how your brain works, this is how it'll be for the rest of your life, which was a frightening thing to hear, I remember, but at that point, kind of as naive as I was about the psychiatric paradigm, I hung a lot of hope on it as well, because I thought, oh, they've put a name to my suffering, and they also have this, um, you know, discreet and focused chemical cure for it. So therefore, I, I don't really need to worry about it anymore. You know, I mean, it's, it seemed as simple to me as sort of when you have strep throat. Well, you, have, you, you, take an anti, uh, yeah, you take an antibiotic or something, right, to kill it. Oh, well, if you have a panic disorder because of depression, then you take an antidepressant to kill it. You know, it was never sort of, uh, I mean, the therapist, you know, we do talk therapy, but there was never an overall push to say, let's get you over this once and for all. If you're anxious or depressed, there's usually a damn good reason for it. If I had listened all along to, to what my body and brain were telling me, I would have changed the way I was living and, and those things would have gone away. You know, the answer, the answer was basically to just let go, accept it, look at what was really wrong with my life and then rebuild. You know, so just accepting who I am, like I'm a climber, I'm an introvert, you know, I don't have much use for being out in public, so, and that's fine. So I think if I'd reached that conclusion easy, you know, or earlier too, it would have been really helpful. I didn't do that much research on my own either because I thought, well, these people are doctors, they, they sh should know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I know, joke's on you. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Ativan, he was just giving it to me to, to have around. Um, but I did notice 
that I started to develop I'd, what I'd call an affinity for it. Not an addiction, not necessarily dependence at that point, but an affinity like, oh, if I take this, I just don't feel that anxious. I actually don't feel anything. I feel kind of, you know, warm and, and fuzzy, at least temporarily, while I, while I take this pill. So uh, there was certainly some sort of, of deepening, I don't want to say relationship, but I suppose it was. I mean, there, there's good relationships and bad relationships, right? It ended up being a very bad relationship in the end. But at first I was kind of like, oh yeah, you know, if I, if I take this at night on the weekend and have half, half a glass of wine, I don't feel anxious at all. So that, um, and I'd never really taken pills before in my life. I think I had some Vicodin when I had my wisdom teeth out, and, and that was about it. I never had this big thing for pills. You know, I don't want to blame psychiatry for opening the doors, but again, I think if I'd never really had that first adamant and known I had an affinity for benzos, I'm sure I never would have taken the Valium. I would have been like, Valium, I'm not taking that. You know, why would I take that? Uh, you know, why would I put this chemical in my body? But it actually was a, you know, yeah, a, a huge attraction there at first. Um, and I kind of just had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I guess I was a novice drug addict, um, which is a good thing to be. You don't really want to be a pro at uh, abusing yourself. Uh, it, it got out of control pretty quickly within a matter of months. I would try to quit. I couldn't. I didn't really know enough about how addictive these chemicals are to know just how hooked I was. Um, finally, uh, about this time in 1996, spring, you know, March, April 1996, I just stopped cold turkey with the Valium um, and, and had a, a psychotic break, basically. Yeah, you, know, you should absolutely never stop benzodiazepines cold turkey. Uh, I didn't know that. I was disgusted with myself for abusing drugs. Stop cold turkey ended up in the, the psychiatric ward here in Boulder and, you know, they they certainly had the wisdom to say, you know, stay away from Valium and, you know, what you did was a real jolt to your brain. Um, but they didn't tell me one, I think, key piece of information was that you're going to feel pretty bad for a long time because of stopping these benzos cold turkey because of the dose I was on, which, you know, was varying between about 10 and up to 90 milligrams of Valium a day you know, on average, probably 40, 50, which is a lot. So I, I didn't know that, and I left and um, just thought, oh, I'll feel better in a little while, and I, I did not feel better in a little while. If I had known that it might take me a year or two years to heal from that cold turkey, and I needed to not add other chemicals to my brain, I would have walked away at that point. I would have just said, gut it out, but no one told me that. Oh, yeah. need to tighten that hole. <laughs> Dada just fell on his butt. Good thing, and you had a under. big fat so, and he spun the hold. You know, by the time winter 2004 quit, I realized no more chemicals in my brain and body. Um, I've had it. You know, I just didn't want to have much to do with it anymore. So uh, th that's when I tried to taper and, and got into real trouble. What I saw with with benzo withdrawal, which I think was the worst for me, was that the withdrawal state was one of terror. It wasn't one of being kind of glum and, oh, I'm going to stay in bed and, oh, poor me, and my head hurts. I mean, it was, it was, it was terror. It was horror. It was uh, the very worst thing I've ever experienced. I mean, your, your nervous system is on hyperdrive. Your thoughts have been completely corrupted. They've been darkened. They're intrusive. You have memories of things that didn't even happen. Um, you know, you can have, you can certainly have psychosis or you can have shades of psychosis. You know, I think even from, from the antidepressants and from benzos, not just antipsychotics, which is a whole other can of worms. But um, yeah, being on hyperdrive, being full of this horrible internal pressure and energy, but also being too sick and weak physically to do anything to, to, to subordinate it, to tame it, to, to make it stop torturing you. That's what it felt like. You know, it felt like I was being flagellated from within by a million little demons that were in my body and in my head. 
and it went on forever. I mean, that's the thing too, you know, I think, uh, I, I know that, that withdrawal from meth and alcohol and coke and all those things are pretty horrible, but from what I've read, the timeline comparatively is, is, can be much longer with psych meds, you know, especially if you've been on them a long time. Um, so, no, I, I felt um, very weak in body, mind, and soul. I felt completely permeable and suggestible to the world around me, which I think is a dangerous state to be in, especially if you're trying to break free of psychiatric care. I mean, if your one goal is to, to get off these meds and, and you're in this state of withdrawal and you're being told that that's you and that's your kind of endemic natural state, um, you can be very susceptible to believing that, you know, you're in a very suggestible state because your ego boundaries have been completely destroyed by this chemical terror. I mean, that's the thing. I just keep coming back to this word terror, but I think it's what it is. And, you know, I've, since I've gone through all this, you know, I've, I've certainly done my best to forget what it felt like. I can remember the details, but, you know, I've, I've met some people who are still going through it, and, and I recognize in them exactly what I was feeling. You know, you can't sit still. You can't be alone, but you can't be around people either. I mean, it's just unmitigated hell. In rock climbing, while you're actually climbing, if you get yourself into a tough situation, what you actually feel is fear. It's just pure fear. It's your body saying, this is scary, this is overstimulating, but it's a fear that you can act upon. I mean, that's why I've always been attracted to climbing. You know, if I'm scared out climbing, there's a damn good reason for it. It's because I don't want to fall, you know, 40 or 50 feet, or I don't want to fall onto a piece of protection that I know is unreliable and yank it out and hit that ledge below. Or if I don't have a rope on, which I don't do anymore, you know, I don't want to fall a thousand feet and die. Uh, you know, because the next move is hard. I mean, it's all very, very tangible. You can look at it and go, yeah, I'm scared because, oh, I know I need to be scared and I want to stay alive. You know, and, and it's actually not the reason that, uh, I mean, I think most people look at climbers as thrill seekers and daredevils, but for me, it's not, not necessarily even the reason I climb. I mean, I actually like the problem solving aspect in the face of fear, but I don't seek out fear per se. You know, you might feel... The only times in climbing where I've felt anxiety are uh, like the night before a big climb because you're sitting there, you know, mulling it over in your head. But once you're actually climbing, you don't really have time for anxiety. You know, you just, you just have to go. Let's go see these horses. Hi, horses. How are we going to get up to our horses? I can try to get them up the ladder. Climbing actually makes you very good at, at taming and mastering fear and, and, and redirecting it or using it. You know, when you're scared in climbing, there's a reason. You listen to it as a teacher. You use that fear to extract yourself from, from a dangerous situation. I mean, when all you're feeling is chemical terror and you're simply scared of existing, there's nothing you can do. That's the horrible thing. You know, you have some, some tools like, like breathing exercises and, and yoga and things like that, but there's no way to directly address it, which I guess is why I felt so so horrible in, in, in that withdrawal state. Like when you're climbing well or, or just con kind of climbing a lot and are, and are used to it, it's kind of fun falling. I mean, if you've ever done the, you know, the devil drop like at the amusement park or a, a big roller coaster, I mean, it's that same, just, you know, the ground is rushing up at you. The act of falling isn't scary. There's a lot of maybe sometimes fear right before you fall, but once you're falling, it's totally out of your control. You're just Ah, through space so that you know compared to getting off of benzos i would i would take a, a giant fall any day of the week i mean i'd rather go you know to the top of el capitan and, and tie into a 300 foot rope and just jump off than than to even experience one day of, of benzo withdrawal ever again is, is what i think you know falling can actually be pretty fun and, and liberating whereas benzo withdrawal is just simply being tortured when you're being told, A, your disorders for, for life, and when you're trying to come off meds, B, these symptoms you're feeling are symptoms of your underlying disorder, then, yeah, it's, it's completely, you know, hope extinguishing. I mean, you think, I mean, A, if you think that this chemical your terror you're feeling is, is, is your underlying baseline state, uh, you know, it, it drives people to suicide. And B, if you think that this state will never end unless you take more meds, it drives you right back into the hands of the people who very likely caused the problem.
Yeah, if I wake up in a bad mood, I'm in a bad mood. It's just because I woke up and I'm in a bad mood or maybe, you know, someone, um, you know, maybe I don't have a boss now. I work for myself, but, you know, maybe my boss was breathing down my neck or, you know, maybe something tough is going on in, in my family life or maybe I've lost a friend. I mean, these are all the, the natural challenges of life and you need to sort of feel them and face them head on and, and own your feelings about them. And I just felt like when I was on these meds, there was just a wall between me and what I needed to really feel at any given instance.